certain things come around, like my man end up, ends up fighting and I'm like, okay, now I need to lose another 10 pounds. So um, just focusing more on like dieting and keeping exercising as like a goal that I have throughout the week and not just yeah. when I need to do it. I feel like women are put on this planet to nurture. Mm. And I just, I just think that that's a natural trait that we have um, nurturing. And I just take that on with my everyday life, whether it's my, my spouse, whether it's my children, you know, whether it's people like any way I can nurture, mm -hmm. whether that's, you know, through podcasts, motivational stuff, just nurture in a sense of just giving back as a kid, myself having a kid, mm -hmm. it was just like, when I'm in the Philippines, I'm not Filipino enough. And then when I'm in the black community, mm -hmm. I'm not black enough. So I just feel like embracing both races are very important to not have that pull of like, hey, come on our side or come on our side right, type of situation. Right. And it's hard because then you have people on the internet, if you, you know, post Asian Heritage Month and they're like, well, why don't you do this for the black community? And then you post like Black Lives Matter. And then it's like, well, why don't you do this for the Asian community? And I'm just like, I do it for both. Hello, I am Telly Swift. I'm a mother, philanthropist, entrepreneur, and everything I want to be. Welcome to Ever Forward Radio. What has been going on in your life recently that you expected and something that you have maybe not expected? Ooh, expected. Um, I feel like I always expect to grow. I don't like to stay stagnant. Mm. So that's one thing that I constantly try to do, whether it's in business, whether it's in within myself, whether it's being a mother, whether it's in my fashion, whatever it is, you know, and, and grow, and. grow, 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 grow. That's the, that's what I wake up striving mm. to do. Like whether, whatever that may be just the betterment of everything that I have going on, whether that's podcasts, charity, mom, just grow. So expecting to work for yes. the growth in those areas. That's kind of what you expect of yourself. Absolutely. Okay. What about a little surprise? Maybe something that's going on that wasn't um, an expectation. Something that's going on um, that I'm working on that no one knows about right now. Can I you spill the beans on something or maybe just like Ooh. a little life surprise that you're now choosing to navigate differently and, you know, get that growth out of. Oh, I don't know. I feel like I, with fitness, I'm kind of like back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. I get to a target weight goal and then I'm kind of like, all right, I'm happy with what I look like and uh -huh. feel like and where my weight is. I don't really care about the scale. And you coast a little but bit. But I maybe. coast. Yeah. And then when I coast, holidays come around and then certain things come around. Like my man end up, ends up fighting and I'm like, okay, now I need to lose another 10 pounds. So um, just focusing more on like dieting and keeping exercising as like a goal that I have throughout the week and not just yeah. when I need to do it. I'm a foodie. So that's mm. kind of like my problem. Like I don't mind working out. I don't really love cardio. I can do weights. I can do conditioning. It's just the cardio. Mm. I got to unbig my back sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> all right, it's, it's getting there where I don't want to wear something backless. So, you know, it, it's hard. It's mm. hard. It's hard with the food. I feel like more so than anything else. What keeps you coming back? To fitness? What keeps you coming back to fitness? Um, I want to look and feel a certain way. When I work out, I feel like it makes me feel better mentally, mm. physically, emotionally better. When I look better, I feel better. So that's what keeps me coming back. And then when certain things come up and I'm like, I know I need to be on camera for those certain things, like uh, full, full uh, throttle, full body. I'm like, all right, do I want to be seen? You know, yeah, with I think a chunk about all the times there. I got to rock a backless dress too. <laughs> you know, it really puts a strict timeline on it. <laughs> well, for me, it's hard because like, Fighting is year round, mm. right? And then when when he fights, your fiance is a yes, fighter, right? Yes, he's mm. a fighter. Um, when when he fights, it's like he's he, it's unfair for him. For well, it's unfair for me because he has that gene, that mm. athletic gene, where he can mm. eat smothered pork chops, and I inhale it and I get bloated. So I don't have that gene, and it's just like I want to eat the way that I want to eat. So and maybe you just need to get you in the ring. It probably yeah, so. Maybe. What's your gut health protocol look like right now? When, when you kind of notice you're mm, off your game, what I take, do you do? I take two things. I take, um, um, I want to, I can't remember what the, it's, it's bifidus and bifidus and something else. And then. The strains yes. of, of bacteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of bacteria. Yeah. And then bio -K. Classic strong probiotics, yeah. Yes. And um, 
if that doesn't work, which it usually does, like in the morning time, I take it in the morning time. Mm -hmm. Um, Fiber, I take fiber too. Um, And if that doesn't work, coffee. (laughs) Very, very strong coffee. Yeah, coffee always works for me, but I don't like to take it because I end up getting like addicted to like trying to take more coffee and Mm -hmm. like, all right, if this is working and I know it's working, then I'm yeah. taking coffee and I like my coffee very strong and very sweet. Okay. So it's like, give me more espresso shots, but add that caramel sauce. So I'm like, Ooh, it's right. just too much. I got you. Uh, in my backpack, I keep this company called Strong Coffee Company. The best. It's organic coffee, but it's so good for you. Collagen, MCTs for healthy gut. Um, L-theanine, a lot of other things for like brain health, gut health, clean, sustained energy, no crash, no jitters, but it's got a little sweetness for you too. Okay. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give gonna it to you. That. I want to yeah. hear your feedback. Oh, please. I think it's going to help you. down here. It's going to help up here. Thank it's, you so it's much. It's the best. It's the best. Yeah. I, I definitely need something that's consistent that doesn't help me gain calories. Cause then I'm back in the gym. So I'm no. like, sorry, I'm like going one way and then I'm going the other way and then one way and the other way. So that's kind Vicious of cycle. Yeah. I Vicious. got you. I got you. I got Vicious. you. Vicious. <laughs> well, okay. So let's uh, get off the uh, the gut health aspect, <laughs> but I'm glad we we sorted out that with you. Let's go way, way, way back. What I uncovered from you is that you got started in kind of the limelight modeling at like age three. Yes, very, very young. How did being put into the limelight at such a young age, like so young? Do you think how did that positively? influence you in your life? Uh, how did maybe it negatively influence you? Do you have any kind of, yeah, you know what? I think, um, with modeling, it's a blessing and a curse because, um, at, at a young age, I started so early and I was taught to strive for perfection. So mentally, mm. I feel like striving for perfection can be a good thing, but also a bad thing. So I feel like that particular teaching was kind of hard because it led me to have like, um, OCD with cleanliness and like you uh-huh. always have to look a certain way or have to feel a certain way. And if it's not done perfectly, then it could be kind of off or not right. And then I'm trying to fix it. And then it becomes something that I keep kind of going back to. And also so, at three years old, do you even know what perfection looks like? like did, it's did all you like have a, a mental teaching, you know, like if I lose my teeth, you're losing your teeth at that at age. So then you're wearing flippers and then it's mm. like, what's a oh, flipper? It's like something that you put on top of your teeth so they don't... So in between like losing your baby teeth? It's yeah, like, like a, you have little fake teeth like so you can smile. No, like just something that you like pop on there and you smile so you have all your teeth. I've never heard of this. No? Well, I wasn't a child model, so I guess that's why. <laughs> yeah, so it, and that that actually the teeth thing kind of stuck with me because mm. I had a little gap as, you know, as I got older. Then I had braces and I had an expander. Then I had Invisalign. Now I have veneers. So my teeth can be perfect. Your teeth look great, So thank you. But again, that's something that like carried on through life. Like, okay, if your teeth aren't perfectly white or perfectly Mm. straight or you have a gap, fix it, you know? So that was like something that carried on with me that I feel like I love cleanly spaces Mm. and cleanliness and, you know, everything has to be a certain type of way, but it can be too much sometimes, you know, Mm. like if my fridge all isn't lined up, facing forward Gatorades, facing color-coded closet. You you and my wife, we get along perfectly. (laughs) It's It's, intense. Do you watch all the TikToks of like the restocking ASMR kind of things? It gives me therapy to clean. I don't understand that. It's like therapeutic to me to clean. It's just watching, like you got to put the bars all in a row. The labels have to be facing Mm -hmm. a certain way, but also it's like the sound of like the drawers opening and the stashing. It's just- Yeah, it's satisfying to me. (laughs) That's the word I'm looking for, satisfying. I don't get that at all, but for you- you are. Yeah. I Like That's I so enjoy it. Like if I go to my closet and I see if I'm in like the white section and there's a gray piece in there or like a cream piece, I'm like, uh, uh, this has to go here. Or it, it's so bad to the point. I remember, um, Deontay had like a stack of coins. I mean, there weren't a stack. They were just like coins on the counter. Uh-huh, and I okay. like literally stacked them pennies, <laughs> nickels. And he's like, are you kidding me right now? Like, why are you? St-? I'm like, it just looks better. And he's like, they're coins on the counter. He's like, this is too clean. I'm, no such thing as too clean. Is it about cleanliness or bringing order to what you perceive to be chaos? I feel like it starts in the morning. If my bed isn't made, I feel like my day is going to be a mess. Hmm. So it starts literally to from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep. And I think it's more so mentally, if it's not in order, 
I think it's going to be a mess. Hmm. I feel like my brain kind of works in that sense of clarity okay. means clean. Not bad. <laughs> I feel like now we need to get you like a, can we get like a cleaning product partnership? Like that's got to be a tagline. <laughs> that's got to be a tagline or something like that. Telly tidies. That's my new thing. <laughs> hey, there you go. All right. New YouTube channel coming soon. Right. Um, what is the biggest lesson? I also know that you were in healthcare. You were a nurse, right? Yes. What is the biggest lesson working in healthcare as a nurse taught you that today you still feel you carry it over into your everyday life? Yes. Um, I believe nursing and anything medical is all nurturing. And I feel like women are put on this planet to nurture. Mm. And I just, I just think that that's a natural trait that we have, um, nurturing. And I just take that on with my everyday life, whether it's my, my spouse, whether it's my children, you know, whether it's people like any way I can nurture, Mm. whether that's, you know, through podcasts, motivational stuff, just nurture in a sense of just, giving back and, um, you know, if someone's sick, like, Hey, this is what you're going to do. This is what helps. You don't have to go to the doctor if you're congested, you know, take some linen and tea and, and you'll be fine. You know, she knows. So just knows. little things like that and just help with nurturing mm-hmm. in any way that I can and just take it on like with my everyday life. And, you know, if I can help some way, just yeah. help that way. My wife is also a nurse. Yeah. Uh, now she's a family nurse practitioner. Oh, wow. That's yeah. amazing. So she did nursing for many years, specialized in allergy and asthma. That's actually what brought us out to L.A. years ago. She went to school at USC for their FMP program. And not to throw her under the bus here, but I'll say the nurturing aspect, I feel, is, is my experience with nurses. It goes kind of one of two ways. You're extremely like what you said. The nur- they're nurturing, want to take care of people, and other people just like see – like healthcare kind of makes sense, like science and understanding mm-hmm. the body makes sense. And then just nursing is how I apply it kind of right. thing. Um, would you agree? What kind of the, is there a duality in like nursing and the types of people that maybe it attracts? I do. I do. I think, you know, if you're going into any job, not just nursing, I think you have to kind of like genuinely have passion for it and not go in there for the wrong reasons mm. or your reason might be different than, you know, my reason of going in. Right. Um, not wrong, just different. Yeah, just different. Um, I just kind of feel like not... Oh, this is tough. Um, I kind of feel like certain things can be handled Mm. like organically. It doesn't have to be, you know, taken care of with medicine or it could be like homeopathic and or it could just be like a remedy where it doesn't have to be like scientifically proven that this medication works or, you know, you can Mm. probably go about in another way. And absolutely, you know, so it's kind of like a a soft subject because like, I love the study of medicine, Mm -hmm. but I feel like if you can do it in a natural, healthy way, why not? Mm. First, at least Mm -hmm. first, before you get into like the pharmaceuticals and, and all of that. All right. So let's go inside, uh, Telly's cabinets, Telly's, uh, medicine cabinet. (laughs) What, what maybe would we find in there that you keep on deck for, natural remedies to, you know, everyday stuff. I'm feeling kind of run down, cold, sinus pressure. You know, what maybe are some of your go-tos? Um, definitely hot and cold packs. Okay. I have um, mullein tea. I have, that helps with like mucus. So drink that and all of your congestion is completely gone. Mullein tea. Yeah. It's like M-U-L-L-E-I-N. I haven't tea. heard of this. Okay. The best thing you can take huh. when you're congested whether it's nasal congestion, chest congestion, it's so good. You can literally get it on Amazon, go to Whole Foods. Right it's so, <laughs> it's, it's so, good. so good. It's so good. And it just helps with congestion. Mm-hmm. Like the moment you take it, um, you, honey is in there as well too. Um, I like to give that like just once a day to the kid, you know, yeah. just honey, 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 honey. That's honey. a great hack. A lot of people don't know, especially sourcing locally within, I, I forget the, I think mile radius, but the more local honey you can source and take daily does wonders for a lot of people's uh, allergies. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just, you know, the juices like orange juice, vitamin C, Mm. just certain things that you could take that doesn't necessarily have to have medicine or like to take like a Tylenol. It's all medicine, right? Yeah, it's all medicine, but just not like an actual definition. Exactly. There you go. All right. I like it. Do you, do you miss nursing? I do. I do in a sense of like actually helping people and um, just being there when you feel like you're in your most vulnerable state. Mm -hmm. And 
I used to work in um, Jersey City and it was a rough environment mm. and I worked in the ER and just, you know, there's times Oof. where people are like at their last point in life and then, you know, is there any family we need to call? Mm. And then they don't have that. So like I miss the aspect of like being there for people when it's it's more, it's the most meaningful time in their mm-hmm. life, you know, mm-hmm. um, of just being like, Hey, I, I made change today, mm-hmm. you know, now like I my change is, yes, yes. So it's, it, it, it was that, like, it was sad, but it was also like, um, a feeling of like, Hey, I'm making a change for someone else's life. And they're able to like pass or transition in mm-hmm. peace. That was more of like, it was hard at first, but when I kind of looked at it in a positive perspective, it was easier for me to cope with. Oh, you had to, I'm sure, or else that's why so many people in the ER get so burnt out so quickly. Yes, it's a lot. And You're nursing is a with... lot. You have 12 hour shifts. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot to deal with. Yeah. Well, props to you for that. I, I love all my nurses. It's great. What has challenged you more to grow, being a mother or being a nurse? Ooh, a mother. Um, I was a mother at such a young age. Um, How old? And you, I I gave birth to my son at twenty. Okay. I was I I was pregnant at nineteen. I was married even earlier. So we, we very young. I started off very very young. I started off very very young, and as a kid myself, having a kid, mm. it was just like. I'm the eldest out of all my siblings. So I knew how to kind of like raise children because you have to do that when you're the eldest. I'm I'm like the manager of like the family, you know? So, um, whether you ask for it or not, yes, (laughs) it's a lot of responsibility. And, um, you know, and that goes back again, goes back to like, all right, am I being a good big sister? And my brother lived with me for many years. So it's just a lot of like pressure, Mm. but I feel like the pressure motivates me to grow and keep doing better. So um, I feel like being a mother is tough because now it's your seed that you kind of have to have that image to look up to because I feel like children, everything that they learn and know, it starts in the household, whether that's their morals, their standards, their teaching, it starts in the household and that kind of um, molds them to be who they are when they get older. So as a Filipino, as a woman of color, what maybe do you think is one unique struggle that you have had to overcome, you've chosen to overcome that maybe other women that aren't like that can't relate to? Yeah, I think um, just race in general is is a tough battle within people. Um, you know, as far as me being Filipino and black, I was born in the Philippines. Um, I left when I was three years old, but I could still speak fluent Tagalog. Uh, my mom made sure still. she instilled that. Yeah, she could wow. ins- instill that's, that in me to, to speak Tagalog. And, um, you know, I obviously don't look full Filipino and I obviously don't look full black. So I kind of get that like tug and pull like, what of like of that, like when I'm in the Philippines, I'm not Filipino enough. And then when I'm in the black community, mm-hmm. I'm not black enough. So I just feel like embracing both races are very important to not have that pull of like, hey, come on our side or come on our side right, type of situation. Right. And it's hard because then you have people on the internet, if you, you know, post Asian Heritage Month and they're like, well, why don't you do this for the black community? And then you post like Black Lives Matter. And then it's like, well, why don't you do this for the Asian community? And I'm just like, I do it for both. You know, I have a Filipino flag and a black fist up mm. and it, it, it's it's just never enough for anyone. And I, I feel that like as long as you're mentally OK with, you know, who you are and what your culture represents, then mm. who cares what anyone else thinks? Not enough for everyone. That's that's a powerful statement. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with, especially Mm -hmm. maybe you're biracial or just coming of age. I mean, hell, the world is a tough place to figure out your place in society, race, religion, culture, personal beliefs, values. How would you advise somebody to to go through that, who is maybe struggling with that, that identity in, in community or even race like you? Oh, that's, that's tough. Um, that's definitely been like something that like has been a struggle for myself too. Um, I feel like, um, just figure out who you are as a person first and, you know, how you want to live your life as far as 
how you want to represent your culture mm. um, and what's meaningful to you and then just kind of push that out. But what if the culture aspect is the difficult part that they're struggling with? What if it's, I don't know which culture uh, um, I'm, I'm, I feel more aligned with or by society standards I'm supposed to align with. Yeah. I kind of, I feel like I heard that a little bit in your story of black community, Asian community, Filipino. It's just, you know, which one's which. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, um, there's certain moments where I feel like, okay, today I want to eat a certain food that's like very traditional in the Philippines, you mm. know, and I love sinigang, I love adobo, I can make all these things. And there's times that I'm like, I really want to eat this. And I want authentic Filipino food, you know, where I'm like, okay, today, maybe I'm feeling a little bit more Filipino than mm. I am black, but it's okay. Like, I feel like people need to understand that it's okay, sometimes to feel more of one one culture or one race and there's other times you might identify or feel more of the other race mm -hmm. and that's okay it doesn't have to be like split 50 50 all the time or like if i'm doing this for this today i have to do this mm -hmm. for this today as well too it's i just feel like as much as i don't want it to be an issue it mm -hmm. is an issue mm -hmm. but i don't think it should be an issue because at the end we're all human and mm -hmm. we're one race in the end. I'm with you. I agree. And so this is where I'm going to lean into you a little bit more. I keep talking about my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same way. She's, You're so, one. You're one at the end. Exactly. Exactly. Love you, babe. Uh -huh. She's first generation Iranian American. She's Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. And I really am looking forward to our children being biracial, yeah. being of different parents with different religions, different skin tones, yes. different cultural practices, different foods, different ways of life in general. I'm very much looking forward to that. I know we're going to have some difficulties with that. Yeah. Um, even with just like with the names that we have picked out, you know, they might look like me, it might look traditionally white, but we have Persian names picked out or they're going to look very Persian and go by, you know, maybe a white name or something. But yeah. what advice would you give me? Someone who is knowingly look, you know, going into that, what advice would you give me, especially from kind of like the parental aspect of, different cultures, different community, different races. Embracing both so they can have a choice on where it is they might want to, you know, take it in the future. Like my father mm. was Christian. My mother was Catholic. So um, Which there is a difference, everybody. Yes, there is very there is. much a difference. And, um, you know, just taking it upon yourself when like me, for example, when I grew up, I'm like, OK, I know I used to pray more Catholic, but I now mm. pray more Christian. Okay. So, can, I, can I chime in right there? Yes. I have a guess. Let me know if I'm right. I feel like when you were praying more Catholic, were you, you were probably just reciting prayers. Yes. Whereas now praying more Christian, you I'm are actually talking prayers to yeah, the Lord. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly See? what it is. And it's just like when you, when you get to a point of like, like I said, it starts in the household. Your upbringing and your teaching defines and kind of molds who you are and you grow up into mm -hmm. in a person. Um, I feel like my parents did absolutely the best they can possibly do, my mother and my father, and I mm -hmm. commend both of them for raising me the way I would want my kids to be raised as well too, just be respectful and, you know, treat others with respect and mm -hmm. just carry yourself how you would want other people to carry themselves and Golden just rule. that, that upbringing yeah. of teaching. But as I got older and, you know, take, took care of myself and I'm like, okay, this is more of what I want to do. This to is figure what it out yourself. Yes. Yes. And, and kind of just teach them and just educate them on both, both aspects of life, whether it's, you know, the Israeli way where the, mm. it's the American way and have them kind of just figure out what they want yeah. more of. Just present the options. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's, background, here's tradition, but also here's you. Yes. And here's the rest of your life. Absolutely. You know? uh, I'm also really looking forward to, I joke, I'm going to raise little spy kids. So I actually, I, I speak that. Russian. I oh, was, wow. uh, I was in the army. I was a Russian linguist, Russian intelligence specialist. Oh, wow, and so I, I'm fluent in Russian. She speaks Persian Farsi. I want English to be their third language when we have kids. I so want Russian, Russian, Persian, Farsi, Farsi, and then English. Oh wow, that's yeah. amazing! It's it's so crazy that you say that because 
my daughter, she's five and she's taking Spanish class and her nanny is Hispanic. So oh, I wow. instill like Spanish and neither one of us speaks Spanish. Yeah. So I instill Spanish in her. And every time she says Spanish words, I'm like, what does that mean? She's like, no, like, it's not, it's not, it's not for you. <laughs> like, you know, it's part of me, mama. <laughs> yeah. Like it's her and I, I love it for her. And I could speak Tagalog and obviously we speak English. So is she learning I'm Tagalog? To, yes. I'm trying to teach her Oof. Tagalog, which is so similar to Spanish, but it's tougher for her to speak Tagalog than it is for her to speak Spanish. Mm. Cause she's like been speaking Spanish since a baby. Mm -hmm. So um, Tagalog is kind of like harder for her to say, and she's five, so she still has a little lisp, and you know it's, it's <laughs> oh, cute, but yeah, um, yeah so now's it's, the it's time, harder right? I, I I have always heard that you know children in those formidable years of learning language and you know cognition literally happening and forming you know for the first time, language is like that's the time to do it. Yeah, like there's sponges at that time. Yeah. Like she's she's I feel like she has a high school schedule, so intense. <laughs> like she has like Spanish, she has. Science, math, um, Bible, just so much different things that um, she's learning right now. Already raising a high achiever. Love yes, it. Is yes. she biohacking yet? Is she cold plunging? No, she's, 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 not, <laughs> she's not doing that. Now, cold plunging, Deontay might try to get her to cold plunge. Oh, he's on board. He, he's on board. Me with too. Cold. He, we it. have like a whole recovery downstairs in our house in Alabama. And we have a cryo. We have the hyperbaric. We have the cold plunge. Ooh. We have this, this treadmill that like helps with gravity. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot what it's called. It's like your body's like halfway in it. Yeah. And it helps you these. like run a certain speed. Mm. How if you want to do four miles in 30 minutes, it helps you yeah. um, run off and takes, I think, like a percentage of your body weight off to run less, but longer. Man, the things they come up with now, it's, it's crazy. intense. Back in back in the good old days, you just would go for a run. Right. <laughs> outside. Just run faster. <laughs> Not yeah. inside. Jeez. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, another big part of your background is being on television and being a reality TV star. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Is there anything that you would like to go back to in general, we'll say, and, you know, reframe? And kind of my reasoning behind that question is I don't watch a whole lot of reality TV. My wife does. She loves it. But in our culture today, reality is everywhere. Social media, TV, TikTok. Um, and I got to, I got to, I got to believe that they probably don't always paint people in the best light or they find an angle and whatever gets yes. the ratings and views. Is there anything maybe that you would want to go back to and go, I wish this was a little bit different or just anything you, okay. Right. She's like the whole thing. <laughs> um, when I did WAGS, Atlanta, uh, right? Atlanta, I felt like it was, I mean, I got pregnant on TV. So my story kind my storyline kind of completely changed and I felt like I was more so portrayed as like the nagging girlfriend of like, marry me, marry me, marry me, marry me. Just the hormonal pregnant lady. Kind yeah. Of thing. And yeah. it was like, this isn't what I want. I want marriage. I want a ring. I want this. I want that. And that's, we were talking about this way mm -hmm. before we were on reality TV, way before I had a baby, way before any of that aired. So I feel like it was, um, it was just like kind of like I was just nagging and that's mm. that's what I want. That's what I want. That's like what I want. These are the clips you guys find? Like yeah. These are the like, and I feel like that's what sells reality TV. So you can't kind of get mad at them for knowing what makes it good. Mm. But at the same time, if I was a producer, yeah. I wouldn't put just put yeah. all of that yeah. out there. Um, but it's that's what's relatable. Mm. So, you know, I kind of might change how I would... Yeah. arrange how it's pushed out. But, um, you know, as far as reality TV, TV goes, I'm, I'm a binge watcher of reality TV myself. I really? love all the love what is blinds, ultimatum, um, love Island, you name <laughs> it. I'm watching it, uh, survive what, I don't know the new one. It's like, they're in the backyard of a house that's like surviving paradise oh, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've yeah, seen a trailer or something. Yes. Like that. Yeah. I watch all of them. Damn. You name it, I'm watching it. Uh, traders, I'm watching traders. Um what about uh, Bachelor, Bachelorette? I don't watch Bachelor and Bachelorette. Mm. I don't I anymore. used to. Used yeah, to. I used to watch it like avidly and Big Brother avidly like years ago. But I all, all these like new mm. reality shows, I'm like, this is intense and this is so good. The last so, one I watched was about three years ago because one of my good friends here in L.A., he went on The Bachelorette and he wound up being one of like the top three finalists uh, a couple of seasons ago, like three years ago. 
And he also was a former military guy. And the producers decided to take some creative liberties in the title that they put about his military career. Technically, they weren't wrong, but also they weren't right. Anyways, public backlash, especially from the military community, was mm-hmm. pretty gnarly. Like, my guy even got a couple death threats. Like, he, yeah, people coming bad. up to him. Have you ever experienced the backlash, the the negative backlash of celebrity life? Yeah. Um, I mean, that backlash comes within, like, you know, your relationships. Backlash comes within, like, like what was pushed out there, like you said, mm. um, which that's why I was like, I would want it a little bit different. So like what I would mm. deal with, whether that's social media wise, whether that's article wise, like, why is it you want to get married so much, so much, so much? And I'm like, isn't that the point of a relationship is wanting to get married? But it wasn't yeah. as like, I'm nagging about it. Like, hey, mm. when are we going to get married today? When are it's we going to get married? It's not every time I'm it, on the scene. Yeah, yeah. And like every episode, you know? So it's, it's something that we've discussed for a long mm. time. And I feel like when, um, it's, when it's pushed out that way, it could reality TV, I feel like it's a part of that person, but it might not be completely who that person is. A or, part of yes. not the entire exactly. entirety. And the way that it's pushed out, it makes people look like that one bad moment is mm. who that entire person is. And it is not that at all. Because mm. even when I've interviewed people on like my podcast with um, that do reality TV, and obviously you have that prejudgment of that person because yeah. of what you've seen. Right. Yeah. And then you persona. meet that person and you're like, Oh my gosh, like this person is a doll. And I like, yeah. why would I think this of yeah. this person, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's a portion of them and they're, they're in the most vulnerable part of their life when they're showing the world their life. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a struggle too, that people don't understand that might want to do reality TV and don't know what they're getting their self yeah, into. Yeah. Um, it's not as pleasant as people might think it is because you have no control over what goes out. You're literally signing your life away. Literally, literally. And, um, I personally wouldn't do reality TV unless I have creative control over Mm. what is pushed out. My friend that I'm talking about, he actually said the same. He he told me that because he was in the army as well. And, uh, he said, Chase, I had more comfort signing my life away to the military looking back now than I did reality TV. That says a lot. That says a lot. Yeah. Love you, Ben. It's all going to work out. Um, What would you do differently if, let's say, you were to create a reality reality TV show, having been on the other side of the camera, what would you do differently? I would, um, like if I was to create a reality TV show, I would base it off of, because I feel like you have to have drama, right? I would base the drama off more so like, business aspect, things that could probably go left Mm. and that you want to go right instead of more like things that you have to take home and it has to be personal. Like, you know, reality TV, I I feel like a lot of it focuses on relationship drama, which causes a lot of people to break up, you Mm -hmm. know, fortunately for my situation, it's kind of people against them. Exactly. And it causes a lot of friction in people's relationships. And, um, because they kind of put you in a situation where you kind of have to deal with whatever it is, like head on, whether you want to or not. Mm-hmm. It'll be like, hey, the producers are like, hey, you have a lunch. And it's like, okay, who do I have a lunch with? Is it someone that I don't get along <laughs> with? Or is it someone that no, like I'm we're fasting, having a jolly actually, time at you. lunch, you know, <laughs> having espresso martinis or whatever the case mm-hmm. is. But it's always, I feel like it's always a setup, you know, and if you kind of know if I was to be in charge, I would just make it to be like, let's say I'm doing a charity event. Like, let's mm-hmm. say the show's about my association and we have the women of boxing and we have a, some sort of boxing show of, you know, women boxing. Women, the women behind the boxers, let's just say. Uh-huh, okay. And we base it on the association till we give back. But our issues are not with our men, but our issues are more so like, all right, we're putting this big event together to mm. do something for charity. Um, we might not have enough tables. We might not have enough people that are coming. How are we going to get more people to come? So like, like remove the relationship aspect kind of entirely from that yes, typical just, reality experience. Y- well, have it, but not in a sense where it's making couples look bad, you know, because they have to go home at night and be with that person and 
the world is kind of in their ear and it just leads to like moments mm. of like questioning that it shouldn't have to lead to mm. because it would have never happened if it wasn't like a reality TV type of situation, I feel like, or maybe late happen, but later on right, where you right. kind of have to yeah. face everything head on. And it's just easier to handle problems privately than publicly. Yeah. So I think it, and publicly to the entire world, you know, um, I ended up getting pregnant and I, my whole pregnancy from the time my baby was born, I had to do my baby, my baby shower. Everyone had to sign NDAs because no one knew I was pregnant wow. besides like my close people. Something you typically would not even have yeah, to think I about. Yeah, I didn't even like post until the, the episode. I filmed 2016. Um, it aired 2017. By the time it aired, my baby was... Pushing one probably. Um, no, my baby was, I want to say like maybe like six or seven months. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Closer yeah. to one. So the words out. yeah, like no one knew. And then I'm on access Hollywood, like, Hey, my baby's <laughs> name is this, you know, and I'm no, like, like have a whole child already. Like it's not a newborn, you know? So it's, it's just very, wow. um, time frame wise. I mean that that's long time ago. Now it's kind of different on the time frame. Um, on like how they air. Yeah. They're, they're pushing Way it out faster. like crazy mm -hmm. now. Um, so that time frame was kind of just like hard to like keep that a secret when you're so like oh overwhelmed with joy yeah. that like, Hey, this child is here. This so, isn't just any life event. This is a child. Like one yeah. of the most personal things that I'm sure you Absolutely. would want to share in such a unique fashion for you and your, your family. Absolutely. Damn. So that was kind of like, um, hard. So just having the aspect of like, you can have little drama with family, but if it's like something that's like very detrimental in a relationship, like a, mm. like a ultimatum type of vibe, I, I think that's just like wrong to put people in those situations yeah. to kind of give them that like platform to just be so vulnerable, but that's like what they know sells. So it's kind of right. like you yeah. have this like, yeah. Lose lose situation, you know. So we got to get you. We got to get you on like a take back reality TV, you know, reality by the reality stars kind of thing. Yeah, that would be dope. How's that not a thing already? I feel like that's kind of an obvious. Yeah, thing. imagine all the reality people come together and they're all like different characters. So oh wow, yeah, it's just oh yeah, my yeah. gosh, I can't even imagine like all the they they actually have a um a reality show now that's like House of Villains where they oh, have all yeah, the villains yeah. of the reality shows. Which, but, um, Immediately, everyone's being labeled as a villain. Like, and that's insane. Talk about a unique lens you're looking through there. Yeah. Like, geez. And then it's like mentally, too, that takes a toll on people, too, because I feel like like there's some reality stars that I know that kind of like, you know, push out that 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 person that they are on TV oh, when they, that they camera indulge. comes. I'm sure. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. When that camera comes on and yeah. even in real life. And it's like the camera is not on. Like you don't have to be yeah. a bad girl or you don't have to mm. be a villain or you don't have to be who they portray you to be, you know, kind of like living up to that character. And it mm. doesn't have to be like that. Just be you. Do you think a lot of people that go on reality TV don't know who they are? And that's why maybe it's easier for them to just be kind of, Hey, this is who we see you as be that person. 110%. I, I feel like there's people that don't know who they are not even on reality TV because that's something that Truth. you have to learn within yourself yeah. too because, again, it goes back to the household. You're taught to be who you are from the beginning of life. So when you kind of get to that, like, your own personal identity, that's kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, we can't put an age on that. Like, people say when you're 18, you're grown and you be who you are and it's not that simple. Legally, that's yeah. about it. That's about <laughs> exactly, it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You mentioned uh, your charity work. Um, can you share with us more about that? Why? Because you do a lot with charity organizations, 501Cs, events, fundraisers. I, I literally, I think I saw just line after line after line looking up all the things that you do and the charity work. Why is this so important to you? And what are some of the causes? And what are you, what impact are you really having out there? Yes. Um, so I started Boxing Wags Association um, years ago in 2017, after I did reality TV, 
And um, I realized there was a platform for the women of the NFL, um, Mm. the women of the NBA, but there wasn't one for the women of boxing. And because like there's so Mm. much trauma involved in our sport, broken bones and, you know, um, mental illness and just um, a lot of that going on. And we didn't have like, um, I guess... a a union to come together and talk to each other or like give back to the community. Mm. I was like, why not come up with one? And um, did you feel like you all were kind of like this Island out there? You know, there was, yeah, I just feel like, you know, if, if I'm going through something, I know someone else is probably going through the same thing, you know, whether it's, you know, you have a man and he's fighting and he gets injured or like the, the physical therapy after the fight Mm. that they have to endure because people only see the 33 minutes when they're in the ring and that's it. They don't mm. understand the camps that they have to go through, the body aches, the, mm. you know, all of that preparation prior to Brain or trauma. or exactly or afterwards what you have to deal with with the healing mm. process of everything. Um, so I just felt like it was necessary to come up with like um, a, a, a group of women and that can talk to each other, that can come together and give back. And our eldest daughter has spina bifida as well, mm-hmm. too. So initially, I was like, I wanted to do something for the Spina Bifida Association. And I started off with that at Deontay's Fights. And then I was like, there's so many other things that need We're running, awareness. Like, charity event, fundraising yes. event at his fights? Yes. Okay. Yes, at his fights. Um, whether it's the MGM, if wherever he's fighting. So mm-hmm. if he's fighting at MGM Grand, then I'm doing something at the MGM Grand and just raising awareness for spina bifida at MGM Grand. Um, That's then I realized help with the family cohesion as well. Like you're not all off doing separate things. I am. I, like, I, I, I fight week is yeah. like it's charity insane. week. Insane. Yeah. It's it's charity week. It's make sure Deontay's good. It's make sure everyone is in their rooms. Like I'm the assistant. I'm the mom. I'm the, the nurse. The nurse. I'm the um, <laughs> the. Uh, philanthropist I'm literally everywhere like I feel like chicken with my head cut off fight week so it's intense but like I just love the pressure of it Mm. and it ends up beautiful in the end um but with charity I I just feel like there's so many things that need awareness and need funds and if we're in a position to be able to do that why not do it um I started with spina bifida I got into autism, the spectrum Mm. of autism. So children transitioning from adolescence to their teenage years with autism. And then I did breast, I did breast cancer as well too. Um, And then prostate cancer. Uh, So my dad had a scare and then I ended up doing um, prostate cancer male events at golf tournaments. And Mm. that that's been super successful for me. And we get a lot of like celebrities that come out and golf and it's not just for men. Cause I'm like, all right, the women, most of the women don't mm. golf that come to the events. So I made it so they can get their makeup done. They can get cavitation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can get lymphatic drainage. They can get their hair done. They can sh- sip champagne. They can yeah. go to the auction. So it's like a full on event, not just golf. So it's super fun. I'm hearing, and most of those uh, personal connection to the charities, is that how you have find your affinity towards charities is someone in your life experiences something like, wait a minute, I, I can do something here. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, like I said, there's so many different um, charitable organizations that you can help and go to, which I feel like I, I still want to do something with mental health. Mm. I want to do something with um with cancer always is, is huge, uh, children's health, um, just things that I feel I can relate to, or someone close to me has related to, or someone in the association might, might bring up to my mm-hmm. attention. Mm-hmm. Um, cause there's so many things, probably things that I haven't even named that need, oh, need I'm sure. help. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, we're just a group of women that just helps our communities and just gives back to Mm. whatever and wherever we can. I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of people who want to get involved with charity, whether donating time, money, resources, whatever, you kind of wonder really where is this going? Yes. If someone wants to get involved, how would you best recommend them to get involved with a, a place, an event, an organization And really know that what they're doing is actually making an impact to the people that need it. Yes. Personally, I like uh, experience that I've had um, 
within myself and the, the charities that I work with. I like working with smaller charities, um, you know, not so much like big corporations at times mm. um, where you don't know where the funds are going Maybe towards. Maybe more like local? Yeah, like, like for example, Breast Cancer Angels, they give money to uh, people that have breast cancer, help with like groceries and help with like the mm. everyday necessities as opposed to like going to like big cancer research foundations right. to where you're helping them right now instead right. of years from now. So that's, that's kind huge. of people like, that are struggling, especially with cancer, just, you know, any kind of struggle that requires charitable help, they're still human, right? They're still absolutely got to have the energy, the, the coordination, the community, the rides, the finances to, to get groceries, absolutely. to run errands, to go to their appointments, to get all these things. Yeah. That, and when you're at a certain stage, you're no longer capable to work. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to get your everyday necessities? done and um, taken care of. So mm -hmm. just just the the more direct help um, quicker. Mm -hmm. I like working with them and and charitable organizations that like help, you know, that mm -hmm. like give you brochures, um, uh, send a representative there, you know, um, a lot of more like uh, hands on. Yeah, very, very hands on. Um, people that do charity events, it has to kind of be near and dear to your heart because um, I've dealt with people coming to events that might not necessarily have that passion for mm -hmm. the, the cause mm -hmm. and kind of just go there for the look, you, can probably you know? Tell. Yeah. yeah. And you're kind of like, wait, this yeah. isn't what we're, he it's, it's fun. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but there's a bigger purpose and a bigger goal here at the end. You want to make it a good time. And that's, I love that it's a good time, but we're here for a reason, mm -hmm. you know, um, you get people that come and that just want to get their Getty image picture and don't want to donate anything or like leave before the auction happens. And it's, oh, that's geez. not the purpose of the event mm -hmm. that we're having here, you know? So we want to make sure people are putting their checkbooks out and it's mm -hmm. going to what we're really doing it for. What is currently the biggest goal that you have with your charity work as a whole? Um, I eventually want to open up, uh, whether it's an orphanage or some type of facility wow. that can house children and um, give them a home and find better situations for them mm. and, and, and in hopes that we can like fund all of that. All right. So that's the ultimate. Let's put it out there. Let's make it happen. Yes. Big, put big that energy in there. You. Absolutely. I want to, as we kind of get towards the end here, I recently heard this unique question that I want to try out on you. All right. Okay. Tomorrow you wake up, God forbid, and you have no memory of your entire life up to that moment. You meet a stranger what would you hope for them to tell you? And you also meet your daughter. What would you want her to tell you? Oh, my gosh. Um, I'm going to start with my daughter. Um, if I meet my daughter and I don't know who I am, I would hope she tells me who I am to her and how I've impacted her life, um, whether that's good or bad, so I know how to go about taking mm -hmm. care of her. And for a stranger... I would probably want, I guess, to spend the day with that person just so they can kind of tell me who I am because mm. I don't know who I am. So kind of just kind of, I guess, push myself on that person mm. so they can kind of give me memory of who I actually am. I see. Like, Being that they don't I, know me without yeah. like... Go Being through everyday judgmental. life and see what you connect right. with, maybe. Right, yeah. Because I feel like if, if you're asking a stranger who you are as a person, what can they really tell you if they don't know you? So they have to have that, like, moment of interaction with you mm. to kind of get to know who you are. And then I can be like, all right, yeah. at the end of this day or however long we spend together, <laughs> what do you think about I got me? something. I'm going home with something. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I, I heard that question. Uh, I saw a clip on social That's media. That's a good question. It was a really good question. I thought so as well. It was actually... And I really want to do this later on with a piece of content. It was two guys that had been best friends for, I think, like 15 years. And they were prompted these questions. And they're, they're, it's filmed facing each other. Mm -hmm. And the question was, if I woke up tomorrow 
and did not remember who I was at all, like, what would you tell me? Like, who would you tell me that I am? Right. It was super impactful and super emotional. You could see this guy just like really be taken aback and get emotional about just the thought, imagining my best friend of 15 years, like all that's gone. Yeah. Now I gotta, I gotta retranslate all that in one, right. one fell swoop. And it's almost like it's, it almost like it gives out that impression when like people have dementia and they completely forget or remember certain moments to mm-hmm. where you kind of have to bring it back to them or 51st mm-hmm. dates, you know? Oh, yeah. That yeah, movie. Yeah. The Notebook. Where, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where I, I just feel like there's certain things that it's just like only certain people can tell you who you mm. are. So it gives two completely different extremes, like yeah. your child and a stranger. Yeah. I would hope my child tells me like, you know, you were this person as a mom and you were this person as a person and you were this person as a business woman and you were this person and, you know, tell me all these things so I can kind of recollect my memory Mm -hmm. on who I am. Um, And then- See what sits with you. Yeah, see what sits with me. And then also I wouldn't want just all the good too. I would want to know where, hey mom, you could have, you know, made more time with me instead of worked as much. That might be the opportune moment for her to unleash. Like, we don't remember anything? All right, I got you. I'm going to unload. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the uh, the stranger part was something that I thought of. And I I wasn't expecting that response. It was a really unique response. I was kind of thinking, just kind of given, you know, your public figureness, you know, maybe I assumed, I made the assumption that somebody would know who you are. Ah. And then kind of give the public opinion of like, oh yeah, like I know you as this person, you know, right. and like you're this person and, you know, just this is what I, you know, scroll through and catch you as. But I like where you went with that. that was yeah, really good. I, I, um, you know what, if it was that perspective, that would be hard because I feel like I would, m- what my daughter would tell me would be completely different than what the stranger would tell me mm-hmm. being what they saw on TV. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I feel like the image that was portrayed on me on TV was a very vulnerable, um, kind of like weak-minded individual. And that's not who I am at all, completely. I'm very, very strong. And I feel like at that moment, I was pregnant, so my emotions were just everywhere. Absolutely. You know, and yeah. I'm like not yeah. a big crier, and I was crying all the time, <laughs> oh, and I was like, oh my gosh, like I just look sure like weak. Like, you know, I'm like, I'm so strong. So it's just crazy hmm. to for that perspective of just not knowing you or judging a book by its cover. You know, um, there's times I encounter certain situations where, like, you know, um, like men, for example, hmm. if they have a spouse, like, they don't want their spouse to come on my podcast. I'm like, you can bring, bring your girl, bring your kids. bring. And I'm just like, if I didn't look the way that I look, maybe it wouldn't be an mm. issue for a man to come to my podcast, you know, without a spouse or like their spouse will be comfortable yeah. with them coming on. Or like if I didn't look the way that I look, people might not um, judge me for, you know, the things that they judge me for. Mm. So I feel like, you can't necessarily judge a book by its cover or what you see on TV because there's mm. so much more to a person than just that. And how many more covers do we all have now? Exactly. Whether we're on TV or not, I mean, we we have the real world here, our like friends and family, coworkers, our social media presence. We have so many different covers to the book that is us Absolutely. that are out there now that we maybe don't realize, but you know, hopefully now this is kind of a nice little call to action for everybody to think Absolutely. about that. And, and listen, the people that are on TV, they're, they don't, you prepare for TV. Like I don't look like this at home when I wake up every day, you know, like I don't have my hair perfectly flat and curled this and all that. Exclusive this, is, <laughs> this is not like, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's very like glorious and glamified on TV than it is in real life. Like it has there's, to be. there's, it, it's just like Instagram and reality. Yeah. Like what you're putting out on Instagram is you're not going to put out like your hair is nappy, mm. y- you know, half your lashes are gone or whatever the case is. I thought is. that was just me. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you're going to put out your best stuff mm. and what you want people to see. Right. You're not going to show them every nitty gritty part of your life that you know, might be vulnerable. So I, or you might do, and that's like you? your thing. Um, I Would feel you say like that you consciously put out reality, you know, I feel like 
I put out what I want people to see. Okay. I I put out what I believe in, like as far as brands go, what I would pick out. Mm -hmm. But there's moments in my life that I feel is not for Instagram. Um, That's, you know, for Mm -hmm. my family Mm -hmm. or like, um, you know, whether you argue with your spouse or like you might have an issue with like your kids' grades. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not going to be like, Hey, let me post this bad grade that my child got yeah. and publicize and like you that know that won't scar them for life. I'm yeah, sure. like yeah. it's just certain things that I feel like are just private moments. Absolutely, that you can handle in your household yeah. and not for the world to see. Well, Telly, this has been great. Uh, you have such a diverse background of quite literally who you are as a person, where you've lived, what you have done, public persona, overcoming that multiple children chair. I mean, it's just like, I feel like, I feel like I got maybe a quarter <laughs> quarter into who you are and what you're doing. One episode, one yeah. episode. <laughs> we'll get you for the next one. Absolutely. But the last question to bring it back home to the story I was sharing with you earlier about the meaning and the story behind ever forward. When you hear ever forward, those two words, what does that mean to you? How would you say that you live a life ever forward? Um, ever forward to me is literally the words that it is. Um, to me ever is just like, forever moving forward and um, just continuing to grow and continuing to be positive and motivating in life and just, um, just go forward up and stuck, you know, it's it's just another word for up and stuck ever forward. (laughs) I I love it. Just keep going up and keep progressing in life. Kind of brings us full circle to what you talk about at the beginning of like the expectation of growth that you have for yourself. Absolutely. Growth comes only from going through hardship. Absolutely. Agreed. Hard, hardship. And from choosing to go and choosing to your point, choosing absolutely, to keep moving Absolutely. Forward. I think that um, if you're stagnant in life, um, you're not progressing. Like comfortability is not progress. It's mm. just stationary. It, it's not going anywhere. And a lot of people get um, stuck in that comfortable zone. And I just feel like, it, it's not a growing moment, you know? Um, and I think that we grow, whether that's in age, hmm. whether that's, um, you know, in in life, it could be a growth downwards or a growth upwards, but there's growth every day. And I feel like you just have to be um, focused and, and just study yourself and kind of Ooh, figure out yeah. how you want to grow and hmm. move. Study yourself. That's, that's an important takeaway. You listening, take note of that. I know I did. Um, where can my audience go to connect with you more? What do you got going on most in the world these days? We'll, of course, have everything listed down in the show notes. But if they want to connect with you, learn more, where can they go? What are you up to? Yes. Um, if you want to connect with me, you can find me at Telly, T-E-L-L-I, Swift on Instagram. Or if you want to check out my charitable work, you can go to Boxing Wags Association dot org or follow that Instagram. And I also have fragrances and candles and all that good stuff. And you could follow that on detellyfragrances.com or the Instagram is the same as well too. And it's unisex. So it's for everybody. And thank you again, by the way, I, I got that uh, little care package from yes. the, the event last year. They're great. It, it's, thank you um, so the much. branding also is Really impressed with that. Thank you. It was a timely, so well curated. timely, very, that's my little baby. Yeah. So yeah, down to the feel tell. of the box is um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> part of my OCD yeah. journey. Which people don't think about what does a box feel like? Who cares? But yeah, you did. And it yes, shows. Absolutely. And it shows. Thank you so much. It was great, Telly. Thank you. you so much. I appreciate you so much.